and turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 this morning. I'm just going to read through the first 11 verses so that we get the context of what's happening here. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, when they laid, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So we kick off this chapter there in verse 1. We see that Peter and John are together. We see them together a few times. Um, their relationship goes way back before they were disciples together. Remember, they were in a fishing business together. Peter and his brother Andrew and John and his brother James. Um, Peter and John were also part of that inner circle. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ had his disciples, but there were times when uh, the Lord went off that Peter and John and usually James were kind of called off uh, separate from the other disciples to spend some time with Jesus. Uh, the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. Uh, they were there for that. It wasn't all of the disciples that saw that. They were there. And in fact, Jesus charged the few that were there not to tell anybody uh, what they had seen at that time. So Peter and John couldn't go back, Peter and James and John, they couldn't go back and tell the other disciples even what they had seen. Um, Peter and John were at the Mount of Transfiguration as well. Not all the disciples were there, but these two were there. When the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead and it was reported back to the disciples, remember the women were there and they saw that the tomb was empty, and so it was reported back to the disciples that the tomb was empty. Do you remember what happened? Two of the disciples took off in a sprint to go see it, and that was Peter and John. Um, so anyway, these two are seen together quite frequently, but in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, it says that Peter and John went up together to the temple to pray in the ninth hour. Why to the temple? I mean, they're... they're Christians, that coin, that phrase hasn't been coined yet, but they're Christians now, right? Why are they still going to the temple to worship? Well, it's because at this time, they are still under the Mosaic law. You need to understand that. And that'll also help you put it into perspective what's happening in the book of Acts to the Jews that are there. Even the believing Jews, the Messianic Jews, those who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, they were still practicing the law. Yes, Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, is the end of the law for righteousness. But who said that? Did Peter say that? Did we see that in chapter 2 that we just finished up? Acts chapter 2? No. Who's the one that said that Jesus Christ is the end of the practice of the law for righteousness? The Apostle Paul is the one who said that. He hasn't begun his ministry yet. In fact, he's not even saved at this point right here when they're still going to the temple. Yes, Jesus Christ, 
by the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary made the new covenant possible to replace the old covenant. But the fulfillment of that new covenant for Israel takes place when? In the kingdom. In the messianic kingdom is when the new covenant for Israel finds its fulfillment. Has the kingdom come yet? Oh, if you look at some of the hymns in your hymn book, it says it has. You listen to contemporary Christian radio and the songs that are on there, you'll think it has. Uh, in fact, most preaching you listen to, it'll sound like the kingdom is here, but it's not. And, and they'll say that we're, you know, we're under the new covenant, the new covenant of grace. No, we're not. The new covenant will find its fulfillment in the establishment of the messianic kingdom. When Jesus Christ returns to rule and reign. Today, it is the age of grace, but it's not a covenant. We're not under a covenant with God. The covenants were always for the nation of Israel, not for the church, the body of Christ, which is what we are today. The church, the body of Christ, with Jesus Christ as the head. Um, at this time, they are still under the practice of the law. Uh, we see that here in... Chapter 3 and verse 1, that they are in the temple. And look back up. Chapter 2 and uh, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord, where? In the temple. See, the disciples and their followers at that time, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, again, that's that messianic church, daily, uh, those who were being saved. So, it's not that they were unbelieving. And you see, it's not just the unbelieving Jews still keeping the law. Even, even the believing Jews are still keeping the law at this time because the doctrine that the law had been, had been abolished, wasn't made known yet. Again, not until it was made known to and through the Apostle Paul that in the church, the body of Christ, the, the Mosaic law is completely set aside. Again, that doesn't come along until Paul. So that church there of Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, again, is not the church for today, the church, the body of Christ. It's that messianic kingdom church. Some teach that, again, uh, this moment here that we're seeing in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3 ushers in the kingdom. That the kingdom's not to be understood as a literal, physical, visible kingdom. Uh, that it's really just a spiritual kingdom. And everybody kept misunderstanding that. Even Jesus' innermost, uh, innermost circle of disciples still didn't understand that it was just a spiritual kingdom. Well, why do people do that? Why do people say that? Why do people teach that and preach that? It, it, it's their way of trying to reconcile what the Old Testament says with what they see happening now. So that's caused a lot of failure to recognize that God has put that whole kingdom program on hold completely. And again, the failure to recognize that is also the failure to recognize Paul's distinct ministry as the apostle for the church the body of Christ. Anyway, it says uh, they went here in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. They went up to pray in the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Um, this would be about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. For the Jews, there's a morning prayer and an afternoon prayer. Two prayer times for them, morning and evening. So they were coming for the evening prayers. But, you know, they were probably also coming, not just to the temple because they were under the law and coming for the evening prayer time, that the Jews practiced, but they were probably coming for what purpose? What do you think? To testify about Jesus Christ. I mean, what better place and what better time than at the temple while everybody is coming to the temple, everybody that can, for the afternoon prayer. So probably to, to testify about Jesus Christ as the people are gathering. So Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, or in other words, lame from birth, 
was carried, whom they, his family, laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Uh, this is the main entrance to the temple. And here's this man that comes there who is lame from birth. It says they laid him there. In other words, they had to carry him to bring him there. And they laid him there. The they, we assume, his family, uh, maybe friends, maybe a mixture of both. We aren't told exactly. But he couldn't get there by himself. And so others brought him and laid him there at the gate of the temple so that he could beg for money. Positioned that at this particular gate so that he could beg for money from the people that were coming in. Why? Why here? Why not down at the, uh, the corner of the local 7-Eleven? Why here at the gate of the temple? Well, two reasons. One, which we've already covered, is there's a lot of people coming. There's a lot of people being funneled to this spot, to this gate at this time. So it's exposure to the maximum number of people that he can beg from and hopefully have pretty reasonable rate of success of getting at least something from the people at these two times of the day, assuming they carried him both times of the day for the prayer times. Uh, but another reason why, why the temple? Hopefully, as people are coming to worship at the temple, their hearts are being set right in fellowship with God as they come to the temple and then as they enter the temple. So they might be more compassionate at this time uh, to, to be more readily um, ready to give something to the poor with their heart being set in that way, having that mindset of pleasing God. So verse 3, who, that is the lame man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, that is Peter, fixing his eyes on the beggar with John, Peter said, look at us. He fixed his eyes on him. What's significant about that? I mean, stop and think about that for a moment. Here's this beggar by the gate as they're entering the temple, and Peter stops and fixes his eyes on the beggar. In other words, they, they see each other. What's interesting about that? Exactly. Most people probably tried to act like the beggar wasn't even there as they entered the temple. How do you know that? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, it's okay. We do the same, right? I mean, if you're going to enter into Walmart and here's a beggar sitting over to the side asking for money, what are you most likely to do? It's okay. Come on now. Be honest. Yeah. Yeah, Robert said, oh, look at that bird. <laughs> Don't make eye contact, right? How many times have you said that to your spouse when you're in Walmart and you see somebody and oh, just don't, don't make eye contact? That's how we are, unfortunately, with people like this. So a lot of people, you know, that's the key. Walking into the temple, just it's okay. Don't make, don't make eye contact. Just pass on by. But Peter stopped and made eye contact. He stopped and he gazed intently at him. He looked at him. He really gave him his attention and Peter said to him, look at us. Look on us. Pay attention to us. The unspoken here is, we have something for you. So verse 5. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Lame man, the lame man gave them his attention because he expected to receive something. They had responded to his begging. I mean, put, your, put yourself in his place now. All these people are just walking by. Nobody's even paying attention. Maybe now and then somebody drops a penny in the cup. Um, thanks. Um, and then all of a sudden, Peter stops and actually pays attention to him and says, look at us. So now, you being the beggar, you think, man, I'm, I'm really fixing to get something here, right? The, these fellows are paying attention to me. Maybe it's going to be a, a, a lot of money. I'm sure you didn't expect what was about to happen. Verse 6. 
Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Silver and gold I don't have. In other words, I don't have what? Money. I don't have any money. Why did Peter not have any money? Well, now think back. He was a fisherman before, right? He and John. John probably doesn't have any money either. So the two of them, as they're together walking into the temple, they don't have any money. They had given up their fishing business three and a half years ago. I'm mean, closer to four years ago now at this point. They had given up their fishing business. So they're not making a living that way anymore. And then we read last time, or not last time, wasn't it two weeks ago, that uh, they were selling everything and having all things common. True communism being practiced at this time. We're, we're going to talk more about that uh, later on down the road. We briefly touched on that, why they were doing that, but why it won't, and why it won't work now. But um, so they didn't have a lot, didn't, didn't have any money, but he says, what I do have, I'll, I will give to you. What was he about to give the man? I mean, think about it in fishing terms, right? Fishermen, if you give a man a fish, what? He'll, he'll eat for a day. So what is that? What kind of a solution is that? Temporary solution. But if you teach a man to fish, what? I don't know how the rest of it goes. What? Never go hungry. Never go hungry? If I'm the one fishing, there's probably sometimes I'm going to go hungry. I'm not that, not that good. I have to get with my brother Don back there to help me out. Um, but yeah, uh, that's a permanent solution, you see. So Peter says, I, I don't have a temporary solution for you right now. I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I want to give to you. A permanent solution you see, not just for his physical need, but for his spiritual need as well. Well, that's a lesson for us, isn't it? That we often think we can't, we can't help people. We just can't. We, we don't have enough money that we can help everybody in the world. Okay, that's true. But what, do we, what we do have, we can still share. And that's even more important than the money. Not, not meeting people's physical need. It'd be nice if we can, but we're called to meet people's spiritual need, which is a permanent solution for people. Uh, Paul said, we hold this treasure in earthen vessels when he was writing to the Corinthians. What treasure was Paul talking about? Was it silver and gold? Money? No. This is gospel of the grace of God that we have. This message of salvation, the message of God's love for mankind. And so that's a treasure that we hold within ourselves in these earthen vessels that we can share with people. And so Peter says, what I do have I'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, see if you can stand up. Give it a try. No. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Not a suggestion, a command. He gave him a command. How? In the name of Jesus Christ, what? Of Nazareth. How many times do you hear that? I mean, you hear Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ. How many times do you hear Jesus Christ of Nazareth? I think under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter using that phrase is perfect right here. Because that was the message that Peter had just given in Acts chapter 2, right? Right? This Jesus whom you crucified, God has resurrected and made him what? Both Lord and Christ. This Jesus. What Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth. And so he tells this beggar here, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The one who has been established by the Messiah in Peter's previous sermon in Acts chapter 2. Now, in his name, as the Christ, the Messiah, get up and walk. Two things this man had never done before in his life. He had never stood up, 
Because he was lame for how long? From birth. And not only that, not only stand up, but walk. What do you think was the attitude of this beggar? What would be your thought and attitude? You're, you're a lame beggar. And this man stops and says, I don't have any money for you, but uh, get up and walk. Uh, oh, yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you, what, you, you think this is all fake, that I'm here begging for some way to provide for myself? Get up and walk. Possibly he was a bit skeptical when Peter told him, get up and walk. And so look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Why did Peter do that? For the reason we just talked about. Probably the guy's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You think I can just get up? And so Peter actually helps. He reaches out his hand to grab him by the hand and pull it. What does it say? Did he just shake his hand and then the man stood up? No, Peter grabbed him by the hand and what? Lifted him up. Pulled him up. Get up. Lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. He firmly grabbed his hand and lifted him up. And how long did it take? No time. Immediately, it says. He began what? Leaping. Keep that in mind for a bit. We'll come back to that. Uh, this isn't the first miracle the disciples had performed, and nor is it the first one since the, since the resurrection. I mean, there, there was the miracle of the tongues in the previous chapter. So why is this one here? Why this miracle? Because it's symbolic of the spiritual condition of the whole nation of Israel right now in this moment when this miracle takes place. From birth, their spiritual walk had really been that of a lame man. But if they will only believe in the name of Jesus Christ, their Messiah, then they can be made whole. They can be made complete. Then they will be made able to walk by the Spirit of God. And there will be rejoicing. But you know what? It's the same as us. When it comes to our spirituality, we're, we're nothing but poor beggars with our hands out to God. Because we're spiritually dead. And even once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and we're made spiritually alive, what can we do on our own? Nothing. Not a thing. We still need Jesus Christ. We, we still need God to provide for us. We must depend on Jesus Christ, not just to stand, but also to walk in our spiritual walk. But it was the same for the nation of Israel right now, and this is a picture for them. Verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Once whole, this man was a witness, you see. A testimony. And that would be true for the nation of Israel as well if they would accept Jesus Christ. They would be a testimony to the nations. All the nations of the world is now they're made whole and walking spiritually. Verse 10. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging, begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Clearly, a miracle had taken place, and they knew it because they knew this man had been lame from birth. They had probably seen him dozens of times sitting at the gate begging as people came and went for the two prayer times of the day. And so it says they, they were filled with wonder and amazement. Wonder, uh, the literal meaning of that Greek word there, is that they were stupefied. They were completely stupefied. 
filled with wonder, I mean, speechless at what was happening here. Wonder and amazement. They were amazed. Uh, literally, that word there means to displace the mind. In other words, out of the normal way of thinking. They're, they just they were speechless and they couldn't comprehend what just happened here. How was it that this is possible? That this man that we've avoided eye contact with for all of these years is now suddenly lame, uh, uh, whole, no longer lame, not just standing, not just walking, but what? Jumping, Jumping. leaping, it says. Verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So they now have everybody's attention. That was the miracle. And then they're going to get the message. We're not going to get into Peter's message now, the sermon. We'll, we'll come back to that next week. But we're not quite done here. Why these miracles? I've asked you several times, why this miracle? Why is it here? Yes, it pictures the nation of Israel, but there's also a little more to it than that. Jesus Christ, when he came to earth in his first um, ministry here, his first coming among us, what was his purpose? Was it to come to overthrow all the Gentile powers over the nation of Israel? Not immediately, not at that time, specifically. What did he come for first? He was sent to the Jews to save them from their sin. Sent to the Jews to save them from their sin. And how is he going to have to do that? He's going to have to die on the cross of Calvary. There's no other way. Remember, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed to the Father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there is any other way to redeem mankind, let this cup pass from me. And what was the answer from God the Father? You're right. Silence. Because what other way is there? There is no other way. Jesus Christ has to die on the cross of Calvary to redeem mankind. No way around it. And so Peter says the prophets, they wrote about the suffering of Jesus Christ and the glory that would follow, but they couldn't comprehend it. They didn't understand it. They're looking for this Messiah who's going to come as the conquering king. And so passages like Isaiah chapter 53 that speak of the suffering of Jesus Christ that just, they didn't understand that. Uh, to repeat what we just saw a moment ago, they were amazed at that. It short-circuited their brain. It was out of the normal way of thinking about the Messiah, the King, who was going to come. What they were looking for was a Messiah who would come and fulfill passages like Isaiah 35. Isaiah 53, you see, it's about the suffering. But Isaiah 35 is about something else entirely. Turn back with me there and let's look at that passage. Isaiah chapter 35. Now, this is about the blessings that the nation of Israel will receive and, uh, in the earth in general because of Christ's reign in the millennial kingdom over Israel. Uh, the blessings that will happen from the Christ. Now, it will happen when Christ returns in his second coming, but they didn't understand the two different comings of the Lord Jesus Christ at this time. Again, the first one in humility and suffering, but then ascending into heaven and then returning as the triumphant king who would fulfill all of these prophecies like this. Isaiah chapter 35, and uh, I'm just going to read the whole chapter. That's only 10 verses. But let's see what happens here. What was it that they were looking for? 
Isaiah 35, beginning with verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who were fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water and the habitation of jackals each um, where each lay. There shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and a road and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Who, whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That's what they were looking for. Blessings on the earth, overcoming the curse of sin that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You know, where we have uh, sweat in our face, trying to make the ground give us something. Here, in the reign of the Messiah, even the desert will bloom. And here, while we're out there toiling and sweating, we got horse flies and mosquitoes biting us and stinging us. Maybe even the occasional copperhead or rattlesnake here in the kingdom don't have to worry about that anymore. All creation will be tamed. No such thing as a ravenous beast anymore. They shall see the glory of the Lord, it says in verse 2. How? As evidenced by His power over all of these things that are put forth here in this chapter. In verse 5, It says that the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. What is the blessing that will happen on the people directly? First hand. Healing of their infirmities. The Messiah who comes will heal them of their infirmities. Verse 4, Say to those who are fearful, fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Do not fear, God will come to redeem you, you see. And then verse 4, and uh, verse 5 again, um, healing also, to prove that, that this one that's coming really is the one who can save you who can redeem you, not just politically, but more importantly, spiritually. And there's this healing. And look at verse 6. Then what? The lame shall what? Leap like a deer. The lame shall jump, you see. Acts chapter 3, Peter heals the man who was lame from birth, and he does what? He not only stands, he not only walks, he leaps, he jumps. The lame shall leap, the lame shall jump. These are the, these are the mi miracles you can look for, you see, that prove that the Messiah is who he says he is when he comes. John the Baptist and Jesus and the disciples, they went out with a message preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because the king was in their midst. And how could they know that? For a fact, by the miracles that he performed that fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures about him. But 
Even somebody like John the Baptist began to wonder. I mean, they were expecting this conquering Messiah, right? The one to come overthrow people, um, uh, overthrow the Gentile oppression. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. You see, John the Baptist has been arrested. He's in prison. His disciples, most of them, have left him and they're following Jesus now. In fact, John, the brother of James, and Andrew, the brother of Peter, they had previously been disciples of John the Baptist. But when uh, Jesus Christ came down and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, then James and John, um, excuse me, John and Andrew left following John the Baptist and started following Jesus at that point. Uh, so they were among the first disciples of Jesus. But John's in prison here and he starts to wonder, hey, when is this show going to get on the road? Is Jesus Christ really the Redeemer? The one who's going to come and overthrow the Gentile oppression. So Matthew 11, starting with verse 1. Now it came to pass as Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Is it you? Is it really you? I mean, what's going on here? Is it really you, or is it somebody else that we're waiting for? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, to the disciples, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John the Baptist was unsure, but what does Jesus quote as the message to go back to John? Uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, to John the Baptist. What was Jesus quote? A passage like Isaiah chapter 35 that says the, the lame shall leap, the blind shall see, the deaf shall hear. So this miracle clearly ties into the message of the promised kingdom for the nation of Israel. It confirms who Jesus was. He really was their Messiah. He really was their king. And that's still what's happening here in Acts chapter 4. Uh, Acts chapter 3, excuse me, also in Acts chapter 4. It's not the start of the church, the body of Christ. It's still a continuation of that kingdom message to the nation of Israel. And Jesus performed those, Messiah, uh, those miracles to prove that he was the Messiah. And his disciples are also being sent out in his power and authority to speak for him at this time. And also to perform these miracles to prove that Jesus really was the Christ. So again, this is not the birth of the church, the body of Christ. Not in Acts chapter 3, not in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, there's a miracle there followed by a message by Peter explaining what was happening. And we spent some weeks talking about how that message ties into the Messianic kingdom for the nation of Israel. Now we have the miracle in Acts chapter 3, and then we're going to have the message by Peter. And I've given you some insight as to how this miracle is about that messianic kingdom for the nation of Israel with Jesus Christ ruling as the king. And we'll look starting next week about the message that Peter brings, demonstrating that, again, it is a Jewish message to the nation of Israel about the kingdom. It's not about the church, the body of Christ. Through a few minutes early this morning. Any thoughts, questions, comments? I find it interesting that he says specifically he took him by the right hand. By the right hand. Just let you know being left handed is wrong. <laughs> no, that is interesting that he took him by the right hand. I, I don't know. Such a tiny detail, right? But so many other larger details we don't read about in the Bible that we're going to have to ask once we get there. Yeah, why the right hand? It didn't just say he took him by the hand.
So it's right hand to right hand. So we can conclude that Peter was right handed. I don't know. Anything else? Nice catch on the little detail there. Those little things that make you go, hmm. All right. Uh, thank you for joining me for this study this morning of the Book of Acts. And I uh, hope you join me next time as we continue.